drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley with my weekly vlog. So I had a ton of questions this week from you guys on a lot of the topics I discussed in the last vlog and I want to go through those a little bit. Um, there were a bunch of questions in particular around the Verify application. I spent a few minutes just talking about it. Actually I had so many questions I'm going to do a separate clip on that to go through the details of exactly what you get with it, how you use the application, what kind of coverage you get, where you can fly, who it's backed up by. So all the questions you guys have asked on the YouTube channel and I haven't had a chance to answer yet, I'll answer those in that separate uh, video clip that I'll put together. But I did put a link below so you can click on that and go to their site and actually do a little investigation on it on your own. But I feel like from a, a commercial pilot perspective, it's a great application for people just getting into the business. So if you just started actually flying commercially or you're starting to do um, real estate work or things like that and you really can't justify the cost of a large policy, I think it's a wonderful way to get coverage that you need to protect yourself without spending a fortune on it. And then as you get closer to regular work in that space or maybe you're doing a larger volume of clips, then it would make sense, I think, to maybe move to a policy that uh, was a yearly kind of thing that covered you wherever you flew. That probably is the economical pivot point for you. So I'll, again, I'll do a separate clip on that. The second thing I got an awful lot of comments on and questions on was my conversations around the Mavic Pro product versus the Karma product. How does that compare to the Phantom 4 product? And I've spent an awful lot of time talking about how I feel like a Phantom 5 product is still definitely in the works. And I had a lot of people on both sides of that argument. Some people are thinking the Mavic Pro uh, is the future of where DJI is going to go with drones and that the Phantom product is dead. A lot of people compared the Mavic Pro to the Karma. And, and honestly, there are people in both camps there, which is probably a healthy thing. I'm a huge fan of competition, so I think that, you know, with the Mavic Pro coming out sort of on the heels of the release of the, of the uh, GoPro Karma, that's going to keep both companies ahead of the curve as far as developments go in that space. So I think it's healthy. I do believe, having said all of that, that a Phantom 5 product will definitely see the light of day uh, for a lot of different reasons. And I'll do a separate clip talking about the Karma versus the Mavic Pro versus the Phantom 5 uh, and the Breeze also, uh, so that people that asked about the Breeze, I'll compare those. The reason I think, one of the reasons I think that the Phantom Pro, uh, I should say the Phantom product is not dead, is because DJI has spent a lot of time and money, a lot of time and treasure, developing a market presence for that Phantom product. And honestly, a lot of the people that when I fly ask me about the drone, they say, is that a Phantom? They don't even really know it's made by DJI. They just know the brand is a Phantom. So I can't imagine that a company that spent that kind of money on trademarks and patents and marketing uh, and promotional materials would just dead end that product. If they really were done uh, with the Phantom line, or I should say if they really, if the Mavic was the next iteration and the Phantom line was going to go away, they would have released that as the Phantom 5. They wouldn't have introduced an entirely new product with a new branding name, new trademarks, and all the rest of that. I also feel like just a little bit I've seen of their marketing materials around it, they're not really going for the hardcore drone enthusiasts. They're going more for the vloggers and the YouTube guys and the outdoorsmen and people that just want to throw up a drone and get some video footage. So I think they're they're looking for it to be a line probably lower than what the Phantom is going to be. Well, definitely lower than what the Phantom is going to be, sort of an entry-level drone. And I know it's crazy to say an entry-level drone is $1,000. I think that $1,000 will drop pretty quickly by Christmas time to where it's affordable for most people out there today. I still think that you'll have the Mavic Pro as the bottom of the line or see the entry-level point of the line, the Phantom above that, and then the Inspire above that. And I think they're clever enough that they're going to introduce just enough features to keep you enticed in that market space for the Mavic Pro and different feature sets for the Phantom 5. And and different feature sets again for the uh, the Inspire. So it'll be an interesting thing to see what happens over the next couple of months, whether I'm right or I'm wrong on that on that Phantom 5. But I still believe there's a Phantom line uh, alive and well, and I believe that the Phantom 5 will be the next iteration of that. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Litchi app. A lot of people have asked me about Litchi. I like the Litchi app an awful lot, and I'm going to do a clip on explaining all the features and functions you get out of that Litchi app. Not that I don't like the DJI Pro app. I think that's a wonderful application as well. But that Litchi app really gives you certain features and functions that aren't available on the DJI Go app natively. Uh, one of my pet peeves is the auto record on takeoff. That's in there. The fact that you can create missions on your computer, download this to the application, and then have the drone fly autonomously to those different waypoints and take different photos and stuff, I think that's really pretty cool advanced features. I also like the fact that it announces um, some of the um, particulars that you need, like battery level and some of the, um, you know, the telemetry and things like that, that uh, I don't have to actually look at the screen. I can hear it. So I think the Leechy app is a, is a very, very cool app. It's been proven to be very, very reliable. A lot of people fly with it. I have friends that use that exclusive that don't use the DJI app at all. They use the Leechy app. So we'll see where that ends up. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of different things. All right, so the first thing I want to mention as a new product, I get a lot of questions on the website and the YouTube channel about 
uh, I'm getting into droning. I don't have a lot of money to spend. I don't want to drop a thousand dollars on a drone. What would you recommend? And I've talked before about sort of the, the micro drones that you can fly. And those are great little, you know, I don't want to call them toys, but they're great little entry level products that for 30 or 40 bucks, you can fly that around the house and it works pretty well. There's another product that I use an awful lot that I haven't talked about. And again, I don't get any compensation from these guys. It's just a product that I like to use. It's this Inductix product. And the Inductix product is different than most of the micro drones that are out there for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a little bit larger, so it's got a little bit more size to it. Um, but you'll notice right away that it almost looks like there are prop guards around the blades, but that's not what they are. They're actually electrically ducted fans, which means this ducting system around the sides is going to force more of the air down, which means you're going to get a bigger lift out of it, and they don't have to spin as fast. So the first thing you'll notice when you fly this is it's quieter. So you can fly it indoors, nobody's going to be annoyed by it. It doesn't sound like a flock of bees are coming towards you or, <laughs> or a group of bees are heading your way. The second thing is it's incredibly stable. So when you put this thing up in the air, it's going to hang on to its position very easily. And you can buy it as just the copter itself um, I, for 40 bucks. And you can buy it with the copter and a controller, which is a full-size controller, for like 60 bucks or 65 bucks off of Amazon and a lot of other online sites. What I like about it so much is it gives you a real drone feel, a real RC copter feel, quadcopter feel, in a very small box, or I should say a very small platform, that is almost indestructible. You can fly this thing into walls, you can flip it, you can land it in the grass, and because it's got these, these ducts around the fans, it actually saves it from any kind of damage. So it doesn't get tangled up in curtains, or if you're outside, it won't get tangled up in a tree. You can actually fly it, have it bounce off something, and just pick it up and fly again. So if you're new to the sport and you're looking for something that's inexpensive, uh, well under under 70 bucks, you can get the whole kit, pop a battery in it, charge it up, and you're off and flying. I also like it too for me to keep me sharp in the winter time when I can't be outside because it's snowing or whatever with my drone. I can fly this thing in the house and stay top, you know, on top of my piloting skills and take off and landing and flying through rooms and stuff. So very, very cool. The other thing I was very surprised by it. Uh, by this is that a lot of the micro drones, even though they say they can fly Wi-Fi distances, they don't go very far away. They lose signal and crash. With this one, I've had it up to well over a house, like a couple hundred feet up, and it still flies just fine. I can fly it way out in the front yard, way in the backyard. So it is truly a lot more sensitive from a Wi-Fi perspective or from a communication perspective than a lot of the smaller drones. So if you're looking for something to play with in the winter times or something to fly in the house, great addition. If you're new to the sport or new to the hobby, I should say, uh, great addition for you. And you get and get everything comes in the box that you'll need to fly that. So that's the Inductix product. You may have actually seen that Inductix product. I think they're calling it a a mighty whoop or a mini whoop and what people have done is actually modified this to put a camera on it as well so if you know if you're into that flying around with a camera and that size uh, there's a whole subculture of people that fly that I don't want to call it I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it it's either a mini whoop, whoop or a micro whoop you can look it up on the on the Google there and find it but um, it's actually this chassis modified with a small camera that you can record from uh, another thing I want to talk about, I've had some questions about this. I've talked long and hard about the Phantom 4 and some of the things I'd like to see changed on it. One of the things that drives me nuts about it is the mounting structure for the propellers. The propellers themselves are plastic. The mounting structure underneath is plastic. So if you look at this, you've got this plastic mounting. The worry I have is that fractures can occur in this, and a lot of people don't inspect these before they take off. I'll pull the propellers off all four of them, and I'll check to make sure that these are on there firmly and there's no cracks in them. But even if I do that, there could be a hairline crack I don't see. It worries me again as an engineer that I've got plastic mounted to plastic. This just strikes me as a single point of failure. And you guys know if you lose one of these blades, this guy's not staying up in the air. It's coming crashing down. So because of that plastic, I'm a little concerned. I was a little frustrated that DJI went plastic here instead of metal. I wouldn't mind that the propellers are plastic, but I really feel like the mounting should be metal. So I've talked before about these. They're made by a company called PGY, which is a company we're working with now for accessories. And what they make are these aluminum replacements. They make a silver one and a black one. So with the white one, you change it for the silver and obviously the blacks for the black. But this is aluminum. You pull the screws off, you pop this on, put the screws back in. This mounts firmly to the motors and that eliminates that, that point of fracture or that point of failure. And you'd use the exact same blade. So basically you pull off the one that's on there, you put on these metal ones or the aluminum ones and you're good to go. You just put your blades on the same way you always put them on and you can fly. Um, we'll be selling these on the website. I only got about, I think, 20 sets of them. So I haven't got a lot of them. If they sell well and people like them, um, you know, we'll order more of them. Obviously, we'll keep them in stock. I will do a separate clip showing a, a close-up, and I'll have a picture up here too, but I'll put a close-up of what these look like so you get a feel for how they mount. Couldn't be simpler. But for me, again, 
it's one of those accessories that isn't going to enhance my flying, but it, it takes the pressure off of worrying about do I, do I have a, uh, a fractured blade mount on there that may cause me problems down the road. Um, these aren't cheap. I was surprised actually how expensive they were. A uh, set of four of these is about 20 bucks, so it's it's not a terrible amount of money, but it was more than I thought it would be, and I guess it's because they're, they're made out of aluminum and they're crafted specifically to mimic exactly what those look like, so they're a little bit of machine work involved with that, so it does take a little bit of work to do that. So anyway, that's that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the Part 107 test. I get a ton of questions on, I'm about to take and I'm studying for it, what do you think the best study guide is, uh, how do you study for it, and honestly, I haven't done any online test, uh, testing and I haven't done any online classes. I think there's a lot of people out there that are offering classes that you can take or you can buy and download for hundreds of dollars. And if that's the way you study, um, maybe that's the way to go for you. What I would suggest, and I suggest this to anybody who asks me, is instead of buying the class that teaches you the materials, instead buy a less expensive test. There's a lot of companies out there that'll sell you an application for your iPhone or for your Android phone that you can download or your tablet that'll ask you the questions that you'll see on the actual test. Now, they're not the exact questions, but they're similar questions of what you'll see on the test. I like that because I like to study on my own. I'll read through the manuals and I'll read through the particular areas that I know going to be on the test and then I can take that test and as I go through it if I miss a question I mark it and then I go back to the manual and figure out what it was that I didn't understand about that particular concept so that's a great way for me to learn and as I take that test a bunch of times that repetitive behavior of taking that test understanding how the questions are sort of phrased takes a lot of pressure off the day of the test because I don't know how you guys take tests I've never been a good test taker I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy in a lot of ways but I'm an idiot when it comes to testing because I just something about the psychology of it I get in that room I sit down in front of that test and even though I know the material I'll trip over questions or I'll read them wrong so having that that testing ability to sort of take those tests at my own pace frees me up to not worry about that. It takes a lot of that pressure off because I've already gone through it a bunch of times and it takes all the stress out of it. So for me, you know, spending 10 bucks on one of those automated testing things that I can do on my phone allows me to, you know, practice when I can. If I've got some idle time, I fly a lot in my job, um, I'll be on an airplane, I'll be using that for 10 or 15 minutes just brushing up on questions. So before you dive too deep into spending hundreds of dollars on one of those online courses that teach you everything, you might want to just pick up the manual, which is free, and you can pick up one of these tests for less than 20 bucks. I think I paid six bucks for one and maybe 15 for another, uh, and use that for a while and see how you do on those tests. The other really nice thing about those tests is that they're getting feedback from people that have taken the actual Part 107 test. So they're constantly updating the questions, databases, and maybe even the phrasing in the questions, which I like a lot because when I'll go back and take the test again, there'll be new questions I didn't see the first time, or maybe they'll be phrased a little differently to eliminate some of those trip ups. The good news is the research I've done on the testing is of all the people that have taken the Part 107, a large majority, more than 60% of the people that have taken it have passed it, and the average grade for passing it is well over 75 points. So what that means is not only are people studying well and taking it and passing it, but they're passing it with great grades. So for me, uh, that's an indication that you're taking this pretty seriously as a community. Uh, I don't think it's that the test is easy. Again, I've taken the practice test a few times. Some of those questions on the sectional charts and <laughs> load, load and weight balance can be a little bit tricky. Um, so study those two sections really well. The weather section also can be a little bit tricky from what I've heard. I've had other friends that have taken it and told me that's the part they tripped over. So take your time, go through it. I sit down with a cup of coffee, I'll go through a section, maybe I'll spend 45 minutes or an hour on it, I'll take the test, I'll miss three or four questions, I'll go back and figure that out. So just like you take any other test. Anyway, good luck if you're taking it anytime soon. Uh, we're working on a series of clips, or I'm working on a series of clips to help you prep for that. It won't be as exhaustive as a lot of the online classes that are charging you hundreds of dollars, but everything I'm doing is free, so you, know, you can take it for what it's worth. Um, but I think that uh, my experience of studying and my experience of taking those practice tests have put me in a position where I can put together a pretty decent guide of what you need to focus on and what you can forget about and not worry about on the test. So look for that coming very soon. And that's all I really had this week. I want to thank you again because I've been watching the numbers and you guys are really enjoying these clips, it seems like, because you're watching them an awful lot. A lot of positive comments about them. I hope this format is helpful. I enjoy it an awful lot because it gives me a chance to talk about things that have happened in the last seven days, give you updates and some questions that come in from the YouTube channel, and generally update you on the, on the hobby. So if you have questions, again, drop them below. Uh, thumbs up are always good for us. We appreciate people that like the stuff we do. If you don't like the stuff you do, let me know, or stuff we do, let me know below, and we'll, we'll try and tweak it for next time. But until then... Have a great week and uh, happy drawing. Mm -hmm.